Okay, hi everyone. Namo myoho renge kyo. Uh, we're going to delve into a tiny bit of scholarship here um, outside of the Go Show because as I'm uh, going through the current Go Show, the Tripitaka uh, uh, Master uh, Shanwu Wei, Nichiren is diving into a lot of historical context for the canon of Buddhism. And he is about to mention something called the uh, the Twelve Divisions. And uh, that refers to uh, some Pali school um, and early uh, divisions of the uh, canon, the scriptures. Um, so I thought it was important to do a video just on this because uh, I talk about study a lot. And uh, since Nietzsche specifically nails a term here on the subject of study, because he's, he, it's a critique he's giving of some of the other scholars and teachers of his day and previous to his day, um, that he's demonstrating where they may have gone awry, where they've stopped and they've only selected certain parts of the canon to focus on, and therefore... Um, Although they're still Buddhist studies, they're they're misleading because they cut off the uh, entirety of the study, the ultimate, the reason for the study. The, it's like the, they study the joke without ever getting to the punchline. It's a bad analogy, but you know what I mean. So, um, so we're gonna talk. I'm gonna talk today about the twelve divisions, and I found s several sources online. And in that regard, um, I'll put up a little picture here of my study page, my resource si uh, site on the web, threefoldlotus.com. And if you follow the links for course study material, starting from the first page, you'll end up on uh, home slash home HTML. And that has, uh, I think, over 50 links uh, to specific documents like this that I've either created myself as study information and, and uh, deeper dives into concepts or things I've found on the internet that I use as part of my uh, study uh, information. Um, you'll find it all there on everything from what is chanting to uh, deeper things like this. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to pretty much read straight from this because it's, it's pretty succinct, uh, which we all know I don't tend to be, but I'll elaborate <laughs> if I see the need. Uh, th this particular site had an uh, interesting introductory uh, chapter that uh, spoke about something I don't hear much a lot, a lot of, so I'm just going to read this first part because a lot of you have had questions. I've heard, I've had comments and questions sent to me about you know, what happened between the time that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha died and this 400 or 500 years passed before there's any documentation of anything? Well, that's not correct. Uh, so I'm going to read this little part here so that you have a better understanding of how the teachings, the written teachings evolved, where they came from. Okay, so uh, Tripitaka or Tipitaka, depending on the um, Pali or Sanskrit that you're reading, is uh, the collection of teachings uh, of the Buddha over 45 years. It consists of Sutra, the conventional teaching, Vinaya, the disciplinary code, and the Abhidharma, or commentaries. So you may have heard these words in other, in other sources or contexts. You'll get a, a better definition here of what those terms mean. Um... The Buddha has passed away, but the sublime Dharma, which he uh, unreservedly uh, bequeathed to humanity, still exists in its pristine purity. That's an important po point, because um, in today's world, uh, we transfer knowledge by documents. 
and uh, videos like this are uh, tend to be taken at face value for someone's opinion, uh, which I offer plenty of. But I always base my opinion on documentation. And um, I've had questions in the past of, yeah, we're reading this sutra, but are these the words of Buddha? Um, so that's something I also answer on my website. There's resources there, but they touch upon it here. And what they're saying, pristine purity, you'll understand as we go on. The, the Buddha taught verbally, and the way people learned in his day, uh, the, the sermons were repeated like a song, and people memorized the songs, the sermons. And by memorizing them, they not only rehearsed or relearned everything that the Buddha said, but they learned the, de the, the lesson for themselves. Because one thing you'll notice in, the, in all of the sutra is it, it's constantly self-referential. I did this. I did that. I, at this time, I did that. Uh, thus, it, everything starts with, thus I heard. So to the point that they, uh, in those days, memorized what was being said to them, they took complete identification of it by beginning, by saying, thus I heard, or I heard this. Everything depends on the translation. Uh, so that when you rehearsed it and you memorized it, you were telling yourself, this is me, this is... M Remember, I keep telling you, Sutra instruction by Buddha was a mental exercise. So he taught it in a form that everyone would exercise it in their own mind for themselves. This was not something outside the self. This gets repeated over and over again throughout the teachings. So the, the point of this is that uh, although he left no written te uh, recordings or re uh, documents of his uh, teachings, uh, his distinguished disciples preserved them by committing them to memory and transmitting them orally from generation to generation. So when people, uh, those that, that set of disciples that followed him around and heard his sermons and memorized them and repeated them all day, when they shared them with others, when they traveled abroad, when they when they shared and taught these same sermons, they didn't say, well, you know, what he's saying in essence is, no. They recited word for word what they were told and so on. So this is how the chain of sermons became, uh, uh, well, as they say, pristine, pure. They didn't get altered. See, that's very different than the way we do things today. So, this goes on. Here's a brief historical background. Immediately after the final passing away of the Buddha, 500 distinguished arhats held a convention known as the First Buddhist Council to rehearse the doctrine taught by the Buddha. Venerable Ananda who was a faithful attendant of the Buddha and had the special privilege of hearing all the discourses by the Buddha ever uttered, recited the sutra, whilst the venerable Upali recited the Vinaya, uh, the rules of conduct for the Sangha. So, 100 years after the first Buddhist council, now we're 200 years after the passing, some disciples saw the need to change certain minor rules, not the teachings, but the rules, how to, how to behave in the, in the monasteries, in the sangha, uh, at that time was monastic. The orthodox bhikshus, the monks, said that nothing should be changed, while the others insisted on modifying some of the disciplinary rules, the vinaya, not the sutras. Finally, the formation of different schools of Buddhism germinated after this council. And the second council, only uh, in the second council, only matters pertaining to the Vinaya were discussed, and no controversy about the Dharma was reported. So the sutra stayed completely intact, but the rules of behavior for the practicants, the sangha, those in many ways uh, were um, challenged and adopted, 
and these became sects. So in the Hinayana, the early, I should say, the early stages of uh, Buddhist schools after the Buddha's passing, there was a plur- pr- proliferation of sects, all deviating not in the teaching, but in the behavior of the monks. In the 3rd century BC, now this is, so, so, so this is three centuries after, uh, uh, two centuries? Yeah, in the 3rd century after the Buddhist passing, during the time of Emperor Ashoka, the third council was held to discuss the differences of opinion held by the Sangha community. At this council, the differences were not confined to the Vinaya, but were also connected to the Dharma, or the Sutra, the teachings. The Abhidharma Pitaka was discussed and included at this council. The council, which was held in Sri Lanka, today Burma, in 80 BC, now this is 80 BC, that's 400, almost 500 years after the Buddha's passing, is known as the Fourth Council under the patronage of the pious king Vatagamini Abhaya. It was at this time in Sri Lanka that the Tripitaka was first committed to writing in the Pali language. So, to those who would say, well, nothing happened between the death and the Tripitaka, what they're missing is all these other councils that were assembled in order to document the teachings from the get-go so nobody would forget the identical words of the sutras, right? Um, evidently, controversy uh, over 500 years, uh, uh, people change. Their capacities grow. And the, of not just over 500 years, but just over your own lifetime, as you study more and more, insights and so forth give you better understanding of the meaning. And then some of the rules that are around don't apply anymore. They just, they don't. They apply to early practicants who um, didn't have that depth of understanding and, and therefore didn't cultivate that capacity to understand uh, the teachings and life in general at a different level. So you can see how this changes over time, but not the teaching, but what happens in sects. Sects who adopt a, a different paradigm for study and their own insights start to take latitude with the teachings and so this is where things start to get sometimes misguided or misguided simply by omission because they don't like something they don't see that it applies to them and they leave it out or they start adding their own commentaries which we'll cover here Um, and this is how the transmission of buddhism goes through this roller coaster of purity and then additions and then stripping away those additions getting back to purity and then more additions it 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 goes throughout uh centuries um through this purification process okay so uh the sutra pitaka or the sutra pitaka in sanskrit consists mainly of discourses delivered by the buddha himself on various occasions. So the sutras are sermons. They're Buddha's own words. Um, I like discourses. It's more, um, it's less religiously affiliated. Words are funny that way, okay? I try to be mindful of that, but, you know, I'm also a Westerner, so. Um, There are also a few discourses delivered by some of his distinguished disciples, like Shariputra, Ananda, Mogalia Liana, uh, sorry, my art background fell in there a minute. Um, it's like a book of prescriptions as the sermons embodied therein were expounded to suit the different occasions and the temperaments of various people, their capacities. There may be seemingly contradictory statements, but they should not be misconstrued as they were uh, opportunely uttered by the Buddha to suit a particular purpose. So this is expedient means. The Tipitaka is divided into five Nikayas or collections. Um, We don't need to go over 
those, um, what we want to get to is, now I have this online, so although I'm skipping some of it because I don't think it's pertinent to our discussion right now, um, this is online, so you can read this entire document and uh, use it as a launching a springboard to dive, dive deeper into any of these because they're all identified by name and you can go on the internet and start digging one by one. Be mindful of the sources because um, there are a lot of, again, this is just like Buddhist teachings, right? There are a lot of opinions out there uh, from whence things happened and what they actually mean and so on and so forth. So collect as many as you can. Don't just rely on one source is what I'm saying. Um, okay, so now we'll get to the part 12 divisions of the Buddhist canon. And I find this uh, quite fascinating because uh, in Hinayana or uh, teachings, they only uh, have nine divisions and they leave out a lot of the Mahayana portions. And um, in the Theravada schools, um, I th believe they use a similar thing where they had... I don't know. I think they may have 11 or 10. At any rate, they they, um, they also have a selective uh, division um, inclusion. Um, the reason I wanted to do this is because Nietzsche specifically calls out the 12 divisions as he's talking to these other Mahayana schools who ha haven't evidently done that. Um, and so you can see by Nietzsche He's all-inclusive, just as Shakyamuni was to begin with. Study the entire thing. Don't just stall out on arithmetic without learning algebra. Um, so, the content of Buddhist canons is divided into 12 divisions categorized by the types of forms of literature, whether they're sutra, gaya, or gatha, and maybe I should describe those to you. Um... And the context, i.e. all of the other nine divisions, it is known as the 12 divisions. Okay, so yeah, we're going to describe all of that. The, the first is the sutra, or sutta in Pali. Uh, these are short, medium, and long discourses expounded by the Buddha on various occasions. The whole Vinaya Pitaka is also included in this respect. So... This is written from a perspective of Tripitaka study. So this is why he keeps referring back to that. But uh, Sutra, as you, you and I know, because this is what we talk about, and the Gosho, which is Nichiren, not uh, uh, Shakyamuni. Um, the Sutra are short, medium, long discourses expounded by the Buddha, like the Lotus Sutra, for instance. Um, Gaya or Gaya in Pali, is the metrical pieces. Uh, these are discourses or prose mixed with the gathas or verses. So there's they distinguish between prose and verse. When you read the sutra, uh, Lotus Sutra, for instance, uh, you'll see that they constantly go from a dialogue, a discourse, and they jump, not every one of them, but most of them jump to stanzas, uh, either prose in some sort of a rhythmic effect or actual uh, gathas or um, what do they call them in here? Verses, uh, which are a brief kind of prose that, that kind of condense uh, the meaning of what he was talking about and sometimes uh, quite different words. So you can get insights from reading that that you didn't get from reading through the discourse, right? So uh, the Buddha did this a lot. Shakyamuni did this a lot when he was teaching because he would have a big long thought and then he would want to somehow surmise it to make it a nice, um, what do we call it today? A um, sound bite that would kind of gel the idea so they distinguished those different things in the 12 divisions as a study in itself. And the gatha versus chants or poems, these included verses formed 
in the Dharmapada, etc., and those isolated verses which are not classified amongst the sutra. So they might not be in a complete discourse, they might be a, a side note of sorts, or a, a, a teaching that was done in a brief form uh, as one of those sound bites, see? For, like, like mantras. All right, uh, Nidana, which I've been talking about a lot lately, the 12 link causal chains of formation. Uh, the Nidana are identified here as some, an area of study in itself the causes and conditions of the Buddha's teachings. Okay, there, throughout the teachings, there are um, illustrations in his discussions of how things can come to, to be and how to perhaps disassemble them. The formations of things in the universe come up a lot in the sutra and outside of the sutra uh, in different ways. They can be very small, they can be very personal, they can be very grandiose. Uh, we'll talk more about that. The Itivrityaka. Uh, the sutras in which the Buddhas tells of the deeds of their disciples and others in previous lives. So, translation, previous lives. You should know by now. They're uh, not necessarily actual lives. Uh, sometimes they are because, sorry, uh, he's uh, discussing actual uh, personages and people uh, in, the, in the history of his town in India or, or the folklore of town. So he's defining and talking about those particular People. But in general, when he's talking about previous lives, he's talking about previous to human life in the universe, the way formations work from the get-go. And this is always, or I should say, because I haven't read everything, this is uh, indicative of his teachings it, to, for people to understand that... Um, <laughs> Hunger, for instance, uh, t uh, let's be more specific. Wanting to eat is not something invented by them, by this human that I'm talking to right now. The, the, the need to eat food is something that's descendant from uh, previous lives, previous humans, pre-human, in the formations of tendencies and conditions attachments, need, how atoms come together is a form of eating, how cells divide and become more and then feed on, where do they get their energies? See, what feeding yourself is about a transfer of energy, caloric intake to burn, to create energy, so on and so forth. So um, every time you get into these areas where he's talking about previous to now he's trying to explain in different ways how the forces of life work how the forces of the universe work how physics works but there were no physics then they they talked about physics they invented number systems and math long before modern people um, they used it to to set up a calendar, to to count seasons, to know when to plant. I mean, there was a lot of sophistication that we take for granted, uh, that is ancient. Um, so the idea that the Buddha would talk about these very elaborate, scientific, really concepts, but try to put them into layman terms, because he was very committed to communicating with the masses not with the elite, not with just the Brahmin class, not with just the, the PhDs, if you will, but so that the, 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 the lawnmower, the guy uh, or the, the ladies who, who just stayed home all the time, he wanted to be able to speak in their language, which at that time was specifically different than the, the, uh, the languages that the, uh, the more educated or the elites used, right? So, uh, that's a lot on previous lives, but it's very confusing to the modern reader who's not used to reading through this kind of teaching, this kind of way of, of, of uh, uh, alliterating. 
Jataka, uh, stories of the former lives of Buddhas. These are the 547 birth stories. Okay, that's interesting because um, as we learn in the Lotus Sutra, uh, it's not until the Lotus Sutra that, uh, and this is a major, major aha moment in the Buddhist teachings, in the Dharma, in the entire canon of Buddhism, when in the 15th or 14th or 16th chapter, 15th or 16th chapter, depends on the, the translation that you read. Some translations of the Lotus Sutra, I think Kern's translation has 27 chapters, whereas many of the others have 28 and so on. Um, but in the lifespan of the Tathagata, the lifespan of the Buddha chapter of the Lotus Sutra, um, he nails that uh, he wasn't born in the, in the lifetime that they are now experiencing with him, that he's been around since time immeasurable. He's not talking about him with the one nose, one mouth, two eyes, two feet. He's not talking about the shocking. He's not talking about Siddhartha. He's talking about Buddha as this mind state, which now up, up until the Lotus Sutra, even though the, the Lankavatara Sutra and the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, a lot of time is spent analyzing how the mind works. That Buddha mind isn't attached to a human entity. It's a state of being that goes all the way back to the Big Bang, if you will, about formations in the first place, pre-formations, so prior Big Bang, pre-formations, the Buddha mind clarity is extant. Now that's huge. Don't get confused with eternity and uh, eternal life. It's not eternal life. It's a clarity of how life forms and all of its attendant properties that's the awakening of buddhism it's hard to understand we can talk about it intellectually that's what this is um but um, the jataka are specific talks that shakyamuni had with his disciples about these 547 separate births so this is him impersonating that Buddha mind and saying how he once lived in the time of da 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 but the he that he's using is a bit of a trick it's an expedient device because for these people these disciples that he was teaching uh, to understand the idea of a clarity of mind that uh, again has a history that's that shows that it was always extant. They couldn't accept that their their Buddha nature was there in their face, and that they just didn't understand it. To them, that was that was insulting, quite frankly. So the Buddha took that on as a personage as personage of his own, so that they could again be they're so attached to that human ness that human thing the body and the the being of a person buddha for them had to be something that existed before in, in another society so this was an expedient means to get them to start to understand the development of their own buddha mind and so these are very specific teachings and they have a category of Jataka here. Then there's the Abhuta Dharma, the, um, for lack of a better word, miracles or the, the amazing feats of. Uh, these are the few discourses that deal with the wonderful and inconceivable powers of the Buddha. So when the Buddha was first enlightenment, he started talking about, hey man, this enlightenment is incredible. It's like it has this quality, that quality, that quality. And to the people he spoke to, that just sounded magical. I just, wow. It was like it was like his tongue was 300 miles long. And it was like he could see around the planet 17 times and, and, uh, or into distant universes, things that we could never see. The third eye thing is about seeing, but it's not about seeing with 
visual consciousness. It's about seeing with um, understanding context and, uh, and deeply integrating um, enlightenment, insight. Okay? Um, so there's all kinds of... Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. All kinds of, uh, of language devices in here. Uh, the avadana, uh, the parables, the metaphors, uh, the illustrations used to faci facilitate human beings to understand the profound meanings of the Buddhist Dharma. Teach the the state. It's Dharma is often shown as uh, an alternate word being teaching, but it, it's more than teaching. Dharma is really about being in it. Uh, and, and experiencing this clarity of uh, of understanding and uh, of the nature, the true nature of all things, suchness. Um, so, so we know parables because there are specific parables, like the medicine, the doctor with the three sons, and how uh, they got a little wacko, and the two took the medicine, but one of them refused, and he, the doctor, had to leave and pretend he was dead and send a messenger back so the third son would finally be so remorseful that he would take the medicine to join his father. He thought he was killing himself by taking medicine. And then he got better, and then the father came back, and he was joy the son was joyous that he had finally taken the darn medicine, and now all three sons survived. So this is a parable of... Uh, incorrigible disbelief in the third son, Ichantika. You know, so th there's constantly throughout, and, and the more sutra you read, the more you'll feel this rhythm and you'll get into it. And you'll, you, it's very joyous, actually, and, um, and entertaining. Um, so uh, that's uh, what the um, Avadana is about. The Upadesa are dogmat uh, dogmatic treatises, the discourse and discussions by question and answers regarding the Buddhist doctrines. Um, it's also a synonym for the Abhidharma Pitaka. So you've heard of the Abhidharma. Now you've seen, as I read through the Gosho, uh, Nichiren adopts this a lot. He'll be discoursing along or writing along in a Gosho and then suddenly he'll pop into question, answer, question, answer. It's a form of teaching. So um, that falls under uh, the Upadesa. The Adana, uh, impromptu or unsolicited addresses. So a lot of times the Buddha would be traveling about and a, a certain crowd would amass where he spent the night maybe. And he'd get up and instead of a full-blown uh, sermon, uh, he and everybody was packing up ready to move. And he'd say, or somebody, somebody from the town before he spent the night would come in and ask him a question. And there were several of his disciples were all around, uh, always around, and he would just break into uh, a story or a teaching. Uh, it wasn't formalized, in other words. And so, you know, his disciples they learned these too and recited them and kept them memorized, and so they shared those. That part of his teachings are the Yodana, the Vipulya as an interpretation by elaboration or deeper explanation of the doctrines. Uh, it's kind of what I spend my time doing, right? But this is specific to the Buddha. It is the broad school or wider teachings in contrast with the narrow school. The term cov covers the whole of the specifically Mahayana sutras, um, like, for instance... Uh, there's some listed on this other document that I liked. Yeah. Uh, Sanskrit tradition places here as Vaipulya a number of important Mahayana works, including the Lotus Sutra, the Atashatrika uh, Prajnaparamita, and uh, the Lankavatara Sutra, which um, I really got a lot out of and and I reference it several times in my <clears throat> in my videos um, and from the Lankavatara uh, to me that was the first sutra where he really really nailed down the mental component of Buddhist practice 
and that sent me to the uh, the collection of uh, Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. Uh, Nagarjuna uh, uh, wrote those down. And uh, those are amazing. Those are very eye-opening. For me, I, I t I'm very visual, but I'm also quite cerebral, and I can get lost in the, my own mind. Uh, so it was really nice to read about how uh, that whole mess works and traps us and, and liberates us and so forth. So that's all included in the Vaipulya. And then the uh, Vyakara, yeah, Vyakarana or Vyakarama in Pali. It's almost the same. Those are uh, predictions and uh, forecasts and by the Buddha of the future attainment of Buddhahood by his disciples. So um, those are encouragements really to his disciples who would say, well, I'll never, I'll never achieve this. And he'd say, no, 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 you will through this, through that practice, you will. I see that becoming, blah, blah, blah. and he'd give them names and all of that. Gave them something less ethereal for them to grasp onto, to give them, to, to create the resolve toward our Buddhahood, our Buddha nature. Um, and this was very important, uh, more so before the Lotus Sutra, but, he, but in the Lotus Sutra he does it as well, because in the Lotus Sutra he really lays it down and goes, this is for you right now to get this Buddha. And this is where a lot of his disciples, who were fervent disciples and students, thought, Wait a minute, Buddhahood is here now? It's for me to grasp at this? Oh, man, there's no way. They were, I mean, they spent their whole life thinking this was something outside their realm of being. And in the Lotus Sutra, uh, Shakyamuni says, if you don't know by now, this is now. This is right now. Buddhahood is happening this moment. Your Buddhahood is here. You wouldn't be here without it. And for a lot of people, that was like inconceivable. So he would have to, <laughs> he would have to give them a story, name it for them, and put it in the future. Even though that's moment to moment, it could the future could be two seconds from now, or two years from now. Your Buddhahood is here for you to experience. It's not a question of the Buddhahood. It's a question of your revealing it, your perceiving it, your awakening to it, right? That was really tough for a lot of his followers. You think, you know, 2,700 years ago, <laughs> um, to think spiritually as a hermetic thing that already belongs and is a part of you, that's hard for us to do now, right? Especially in a culture, uh, in a culture in a day and age when people are so fond of pointing the finger or waiting to be given, instead of understanding that it's the Gohanzen does not exist outside yourself. It is within you, part of you, you. Okay, so um, the nine divisions, like I said earlier. Uh, leave out the Mahayana, I think it says here. Yeah, the term is generally referred to as Hinayana, or the small vehicle, uh, and the Mahayana, the greater vehicle, right? There are only nine divisions, in, uh, excluding the Udana, Vaipulya, and Vyakarana. Vyakarana. However, there is also a Mahayana division of nine of 12 divisions, um, we don't have the Nidana, Avadana, and Upadesa. That would be your uh, Theravada school, generally. They're not all the same. And uh, I know everything I say here um, sounds very, uh, how shall I say? Keep in mind, that sectarianism is always going to be a debatable thing. Sectar sects are debates. And so what Nietzsche is always reminding us, as did Shakyamuni, is you have to study outside of sectarianism. You have to study the entire thing. Be your own sect, but judge your knowledge and experience of the teachings 
like you would your own life. Be all inclusive. Don't listen to anybody. Don't listen. Don't follow the persons. Follow the law, right? That's what that means. So, um, I think that's enough for now. Uh, you can, like I said, use the document. Go online. Go to threefoldlaws.com. Find uh, the button. It'll say uh, twelve uh, divisions of the scripture on the button. Click on the button, a PDF will open. You can print it out, you can read it online. It's not that long. But use it as a foundation document to take terms and go dig deeper. What does upada mean? What, take it apart uh, in the vernacular. What do different schools say about that, what it means to them? I mean, study to your delight. Study to the point where you feel you understand. Don't force it. But just, it may be that you study something and it just uh, entertains you. Fine, leave it at that. Move on. Keep studying. It may be that you end up coming back to that same thing four or five years later. And it will have a completely different depth of meaning to you. That's why it's important. Don't do like you did in high school and and ache, break your head, staying up till two in the morning. Oh man, I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to be ready for the test. Don't be like that. Um, unless it works for you. <laughs> I, can't, I have to be all inclusive here. I mean, there were moments when I did that um, with other subjects outside of Buddhism. But Buddhism can, I, I, I like, I like to deep, dig deeply into things. Uh, because sometimes things won't make sense to me until I dig to, to, to the point where I, I can't stay awake. And and then when I'm laying in bed and I can't fall asleep because my mind's going, and thinking of all these things, uh, it's usually about the time I go to sleep or when I wake up in the morning uh, or during the night that I'll have these huge aha moments in, or sometimes occasionally, Duh, <laughs> you know, but that's the nature of our karma, the way, the way that we perceive the world and our own lives within it, right? The same thing. So uh, with that, I think I'm ready to go ahead and do uh, part two of the Tripitaka Master Shanwu Wei. Uh, but I'll link them back and forth because this discussion is contained in a single sentence of that Go Show. And I want to make sure uh, that there's adequate uh, uh, reference for that as I read it. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. I truly appreciate your participating in these videos simply by watching. And anything else is, is gravy. So thank you. Namu myoho See you again.